This week, we're going to talk about the deep space EVA that shouldn't have happened. That's right. We're taking you back 51 years to find out what happened when Apollo 15 was on the way back from the moon. Please give us a follow on our social media. We're at Space and Things 1 on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. And don't forget to hit that share button. But right now, enjoy episode 81 of the Space and Things Podcast. Oh my God. Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 81 of our podcast. This is a predominantly pre recorded show, but I'll pop in later with this week's news. But before we get started, I have, I've just got to talk about Facebook for a moment. Right. Facebook is rolling out podcasts. Oh, wow. Uh, apparently, this is happening in the US, in the UK, and a couple of other countries. But it's all a bit unclear of what's going on. So if you're in the US or in the UK, can you go on our Facebook page? Do me a favor, because obviously I'm an admin, so I don't get to see things as normal people do, right? And try see if you can find at the top a tab that says podcasts. And if you can, click on it. It may only be on mobile. It might not be on desktop. It may only be on mobile. We're not sure yet. But if you can find that tab and all the episodes come up and there's a button called follow or subscribe, can you let me know if it works? Uh, Because I'm intrigued and we've been told it's going to happen and we just want to know what's going on with it. So a little bit of admin. Can you help us out? If you use Facebook, maybe on your mobile, can you go on a Space and Things page, which, as Emily said, is Space and Things Podcast on Facebook. If you just put that in the search bar, you'll find it. See if you can find the podcast tab and see if the episodes show up for us. And, and maybe it might be a place where you start listening to podcasts. If it works, who knows? Who knows? Yes, absolutely. That would be awesome. So I am off this week. I'm getting a minor surgery done. I'm fine. I'll be back very soon. But uh, we pre-recorded this episode today, uh, which was l- last week. So we're doing a little <laughs> bit of time travel. Yeah. But uh, it's all good. But we think you'll enjoy this show a lot. Absolutely. Hello, Houston. Apollo 15. The Falcon is on its perch. Right then. So a few weeks back, Emily published a wonderful article on our Medium blog. And the article was called The Deep Space EVA That Shouldn't Have Happened. Apollo 15, Jim Irwin, and Medical Transparency at NASA 1971. I enjoyed it so much that I really wanted to do an episode on this, and it seemed perfect for when we had to pre-record something. Now, we did do a 50th anniversary episode for Apollo 15 with Francis French on episode 48. That seemed like yesterday, Emily. Right. How is it nearly 40 weeks ago? Anyway, if you want more of an overview of that mission, check out that episode. Within that episode, we did mention what we're about to talk about, but... We're going to go into that in a lot more detail right now. So, Emily, tell us what happened on the 5th of August, 1971. Okay. Basically, what happened was Al Warden uh, made a a pretty famous uh, deep space EVA. He went out of the command module uh, Endeavor. He really wasn't out of the capsule very long because he'd he'd really practiced this in the water tank a lot, but... um, He went out there to collect some film and to do some observations and stuff like that. But notably, it was the first deep space EVA, you know, between the moon and the Earth. It was a translunar EVA. And on 16, Ken Mattingly would do one. And on 17, Ron Evans would do one as well. But one thing that a lot of people aren't aware of is Jim Irwin was standing in the command module hatch at the time to basically to assist Warden out. And Scott, of course, was the commander, and he was uh, still inside the capsule, probably monitoring systems and things like that. But um, both Scott and Irwin, when they were on the moon surface, they had had heart irregularities because um, all the potassium got leached out of their bodies on the moon. They got dehydrated, and Irwin especially did. When he was on the moon, he was suffering from something called bigeminy. And I'm not a medical expert, I had to consult with a friend of mine who's uh, got a medical degree to write the article because I do not have that background. But um, he he started to suffer from something called bigeminy, which I think is when your heart, the the ventricles pump at the same time, which is really bad. So basically, he was in cardiac distress on the moon, and the decision on Earth was basically the head flight surgeon, who I don't think was actually 
assigned to Apollo 15, but I believe it became his command decision almost. The head flight surgeon, who was Charles Barry, was basically like, well, he's in a pure oxygen environment and he's being monitored. That's really all we can do. So their decision, the ground's decision at the time, and I want to make it clear that it wasn't the flight director's decision. Like, um, I know Jerry Griffin was the head, I think the head flight director of that mission. That was not his decision. It was above him. I don't want to make it sound like a mission control screwed up. Mm. This isn't anything like that at all. I think it was above their heads, really. Basically, the decision was, we're not going to tell them. And what happened was Deke Slayton commanded or told Dave Scott, hey, I want you and Jim to take a, a second all, which was a 1960 sleeping pill to get some good sleep tonight. Al Warden can take one if he wants to. And Al Warden heard this and was like, that's weird. Why do they have to take one? And I don't have to take one. He thought that was odd. And Scott heard the same thing. And he thought that was odd, too, because he was like, why are they prescribing us sleeping pills? Because, you know, if an emergency happens, we got to be on our toes. So Scott made the command decision that they were not going to take sleeping pills because he didn't want them to be impaired because he didn't have that piece of information that they had suffered from heart stuff on the moon. And in the meantime, Jim Irwin, you know, was really tired. He was showing the effects of what was happening to him, you know. So after Irwin and Scott had come back from the moon, you know, they did go to sleep for quite some time. They got some rest. And pretty much the next day, it was something uh, forgotten about. I guess Irwin's heart must have gone back to apparently normal around that time or something like that. And on August 5th, Warden went to do the translunar EVA and having talked to Warden and having read Falling to Earth and having read the new book, The Light of Earth, I honestly think Al had regrets about it. Like, I think he was like, why didn't they tell us anything? Because I think Al's feeling was if Jim had had a heart attack in the hatchway while I was walking in space, this would have been a bad thing. Like we would have been in danger, you know? And I think that's what Al was freaked out about. And they didn't tell them anything. And I think Scott felt the same way. But here's another twist. None of them figured this out until after they returned to Earth, which was on August 7th. So all of them were really left in the dark about it. And almost two years later, Irwin had a heart attack, his first heart attack. And uh, I, I don't know if we'll ever know, but it's theorized that what happened to him on the moon may have started the chain of, you know, him having heart problems that really plagued him until the day he died. I was really intrigued to write about it, not because I love, (laughs) because you like digging up stuff from the past that's controversial. It's not really that. It's just, um, (laughs) I was intrigued by the fact that sometimes when you read different accounts or accounts of the same story by people, there's a lot of differences. And I noticed with Warden and Scott's account, they were almost the same. Like, they really matched up. Like, yeah, nobody told us anything. Irwin's had a few differences. Like, Irwin basically said they told us all to take a sleeping pill. Which runs a little contrary to what Scott and Warden said. But then I figured Irwin may have been so out of it and fatigued by that point, he may have just forgotten that. Also, he may not have given it as much thought as to what it meant as the other two did because he was in that. Whereas the other two were thinking, why have they said that? He was just thinking... Oh, yeah, I need a sleeping pill. I'm exhausted. Rather than, why did they not ask Al to take one? He just may not have been able to process, so therefore never thought of it later on. Yeah, exactly. And um, like I said, I think later Al Warden really sort of regretted not knowing about it. And I think if Dave Scott and if Al Warden had been aware of this, they may have canceled the EVA altogether. I think Al would have been okay with that decision because I think his attitude would have been more like, I don't want an emergency to happen. Or... If they decided to go on with the EVA, I think Scott would have been in the hatch and not Irwin. And I don't know. The reason why I wrote it is because it was just bothering me. I'd gotten the sense talking to Al, you know, over the years that he was proud of it. But I think there was a small part of him that regretted it because he I think he was like, we didn't know what was happening with Jim. But they just did not have that piece of information at the time. If you fast forward now, it's 51 years later almost. I think now 
NASA's culture medically is is pretty different. You know, we've we've heard about the story of an astronaut having a deep vein thrombosis in her jugular on the ISS. I think it was a, a woman astronaut. They never obviously released her name because of confidentiality, yeah. which is fine. And we've heard about other people on the ISS. Yeah, recently we announced that on the news, didn't we? Mark Van der Hey with his pinched nerve. Yeah, exactly. And the pinched nerve is a kind of a minor issue, so it's not life-threatening or anything. Mm. But NASA is now pretty open about that stuff. I think maybe the culture also was, and, and feel free to agree or disagree with me, you might have some insight into this, but I think it was also the culture of, oh, we're these badass test pilots and nothing bad is going to happen to us and we're kind of very macho and stuff like this. I think part of the culture with NASA was that too because they didn't trust flight surgeons. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, you're probably right there. My own observations of this come from following the Apollo 50th Twitter account, which tweets in real time what happened 50 years ago. I've mentioned this many times and I'll put a link in the show notes. It's been really great over the last few years. I haven't spent time following what's been going on on there. I'd say that actually there probably was a fair amount of openness to the public about what was going on or definitely tried to be open. Uh, so there was this public affairs officer, a guy called Jack King, who yeah. uh, that's the voice you're going to recognise from so many videos and, and clips. Uh, anyway, he would translate what was happening to the press and quite often in his briefings, he would say whether the astronauts had taken um, a sleeping pill or an indigestion tablet or whatever it is. And he'd also announce the astronauts' heart rates at key times in the mission. So that's true. They did like to keep the public informed on some things, but perhaps, you know, who knows that maybe that was just a big smoke screen for what was really happening. Um, who, maybe that continues to happen to today. We won't really know. Anyway, with regards to astronauts being too macho to report their issues, yeah, that may have been true to an extent, but when you look at Apollo 8, for example, the crew did let mission control know that Borman had been sick. They didn't do it over the, the, the main radio. Um, but they recorded a message yeah. which they knew someone would listen to back on the ground and hoped that they would handle it discreetly. So even though they knew there was a risk of abort, yeah. they still did let Mission Control know. Yeah, and it's ironic to me a little bit because on Skylab 4, they got in trouble for, you know, Bill Pogue got in trouble for barfing. And that was kind of the beginning of like the end, I guess. <laughs> you know, he got because they tried <laughs> to cover it up because at the time... NASA's attitude was, okay, we can't have puking or any medical incidents because the space shuttle was being developed. And NASA really wanted to show that, okay, we're going to let, you know, regular people can fly on the space shuttle, right? We're going to have random people on yeah. the shuttle like you and me in stuff. And, you know, and who barfs first on Skylab 4? <laughs> it's, it's the Thunderbirds pilot, you know? So they really plugged it in like, you guys can't get that out there. But when they tried to, you know deal with it quietly, NASA didn't like it, which I thought was kind of ironic. So that was the the next medical story other than the Borman thing during Apollo that I could think of, but it was not an emergency. I mean, a lot of people barf in space when they first get there. It's yeah. just ironic that it was the guy who flew Air Force Thunderbird planes, you know? Yeah, I, I know we've gone off track a little bit from uh, Jim Irwin's heart problems, but yeah, the space, space sickness problem does seem to hit people rather randomly, doesn't it? it you, you can get it if you're a pilot who's flown thousands of hours in fighter jets, but someone who hasn't flown that much doesn't seem to get it. It, it does feel pretty random. Um, another instrument, instrument uh, another incident that's just come to mind, which I can think of, is um, the Apollo 9 EVA, uh, where Rusty Swicart got space sickness, and as a result, the commander, Jim McDivitt, Cancelled the EVA uh, until we felt better. Obviously, they did it at a later time in the mission. Um, but at first, they didn't know that. They just cancelled it outright. And also, um, yep. Apollo 7, they all suffered from head colds. And I don't think NASA tried to cover either of those things up. So it's certainly an area worthy of study to find out exactly what was and wasn't presented to the public and how accurately it was given out by NASA at the time compared to what we now know happened. The Rusty story uh, is interesting, though, because of the similarities with the Jim Irwin case, right? So in this case, the EVA was cancelled at first because of him being sick. And if he'd been sick in the suit, that would have been a disaster. Uh, so 
Although yeah. when he felt better, they did then allow him to perform the, the EVA. But you'd think that the same rules would then apply to Jim Irwin, right? So the, the main EVA on Apollo 15 was actually done by Al Warden, but all of the crew had to suit up and the cabin had to be depressurized. And Jim Owen was, as you said, was going to be standing in the hatch. So if there was a chance he could be sick in that process, and obviously maybe not physically vomit, but uh, have yeah. a heart problem, um, surely if there was a chance of that, yeah, they would have stopped the EVA. Maybe yes. they didn't know how bad his heart actually was at that point. It's hard to say. I feel like some of the... Some of what I wrote is almost speculative because, and I hate to bring this up because, you know, I know Jim Irwin's family is out there and I, I you know, I don't want to bring up anything painful for them, but for all we know, he, he could have had something, a heart issue before the before, mission that yeah. was, that was undetected and nobody knew about it. That's, it's not unheard of. No, absolutely. I know people in, in, you know, non-astronauts who, you know, they're just chilling and one day they're, they call you up like, yo, I'm in the hospital. <laughs> like what? <laughs> Yeah, I'm having heart surgery, so it's really hard to say. But um, one thing that really gets me about there's there's some pictures, and I, I want to give some shout outs. There's a few people in space hipsters who, who, who steered me to the right direction where to go. But um, the pictures of uh, Dave's hands, oh my god! Oh yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, they put them in the article. Didn't yes. you? crazy stuff. Yeah, he wrecked his hands like totally. Like his fingernails are just yeah, my fingernails are painted black right now and they look like mine i was like wow dave's all goth and then i was like nope nope that's not nail polish that's <laughs> no he bruised his hands up really bad like he injured himself like that to me is like a testament of how hard those guys worked on the moon i mean really they they yeah. did everything <laughs> oh my god but yeah it was just a story that's always intrigued me because like you said you know and you brought up a very good point you know, okay, on Apollo 9, they let, you know, they canceled Rusty's EVA until he felt better. Why did they let Irwin go outside, you know, even in the hatch on on this, you know, and he was potentially, you know, had heart issues. I, that is very unusual to me, but I honestly think if Scott and Warden had been informed of this or the crew had been informed of this in any way whatsoever, I think things would have been different. Either it would have been canceled or Scott would have just swapped out and been like, okay, well, we're yeah, going to expedite mean, the, the, this the obvious, process. I mean, I think you're right because it was Jim McDivitt, the, the commander on a nine that made the decision. Yes. And I think Scott would have done something very similar. Yeah. He, he wouldn't have been the first one to make that decision. He definitely won't be yeah. the last either. There'll be other commanders who make similar decisions based on the health of their crew as they know it. But they have to know it, right? A heart defect is is obviously harder to know about than seeing someone being visibly sick. Jim McDivitt could see that Rusty wasn't well. Dave Scott wouldn't have been able to see that Jim Irwin heart, Jim Irwin's heart was playing up. But if the flight surgeons had graphs, maybe they should have shared that information. It's decisions like this are much easier when you can actually see it. Exactly. No, you're exactly right. You're right on the line there. Uh, I put some quotes in the article from Dave's book and and from Warden's books where, you know, they're both very upset about it, you know, and and I want to make it clear I'm not blaming, you know, Jerry Griffin or any of the, you know, the flight directors over this. I think that decision came above them. I think if it had been up to them almost, I think they would have acted differently as well. I, I think that, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, I want to make it very clear I'm yeah. not holding them responsible for any of that because I think that was almost something in like above their heads. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think at the end of the day where where everyone is lucky in that regard is that Jim was ultimately okay. Yeah, he returned home alive. At, and the And the EVA was successful. Yeah. So I think, you know, with how different this conversation could have been if, if it had gone the other way. I mean, I think everyone would know the name Jim Irwin. Yeah. Uh, which is a, a sad twist in it of it, really, isn't it, actually? It is a sad twist. <laughs> it would have taken that for him to be more well-known. But anyway. That is a sad twist of fate. You know, I did meet Jim Irwin when I was a kid. I was very young. I was nine years old. Yeah. But I did meet him, and he was awesome. He was very sweet and friendly to kids. Uh, I do remember he was really small. He was very handsome. He's about as good looking as he looked in the photographs and stuff. And now I'm going to get all the letters. Emily, that's sexist. You can't say. 
No, he was he was a handsome guy. Like even Al Warden was like he was really good looking. Like he looked like a beach boy, you know. I I remember he was really skinny. He could have probably eaten a few sandwiches and he would have been okay type of thing. But <laughs> but my main memory of him was that he was very sweet and very gentle and friendly. You know, that's the memory that I'll, I'll leave with. It, it's funny because it really takes all kinds because you know we talk about Apollo fifteen. They're the all Air Force crew, but. There's such a different mix of personalities on that crew. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Jim was kind of quiet, you know, whereas, you know, Dave was very like a Mr. Air Force in charge and, and Al was just Al. So <laughs> very, very yeah. different mix of people. And it worked. It did work. It was, you know, as we talked about before, very, very, very successful mission. Yeah, I think probably one of the most, if not... I'm a little biased because 15 is my personal favorite, but I think that was probably the most successful one. I mean, they got so much done. Yeah, they really did. Uh, going back to the EVA for a second, isn't it a shame that we actually only really have one photo of our warden doing that EVA? Yeah, the only picture we have is uh, really of, well, we have the some paintings of it that are pretty uh, awesome. Like there's the Pierre Mion yeah. painting. The only picture we have of the translunar EVA that Al did was of his butt. So, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. That's it. So, obviously, if you've got this far listening to us, you might want to look at some of these images we've discussed. Well, Emily did put them in her article as well. So, when you look at the show notes, the first link you'll see is to Emily's Medium blog on this subject. And make sure you subscribe to that blog while you're reading it so you can get those blogs delivered straight to your inbox. Hello, Houston. The Endeavour is on station with cargo, and what a fantastic sight. So now we're on to this week's news, and I'm afraid it's just me delivering it to you this week, but hopefully that won't be too painful for you. We've had just two launches since we last recorded, one SpaceX Falcon 9 from Kennedy Space Center, and an Astra Rocket 3 launch from Alaska, getting Astra back on track following their failure last month. Details of their payloads and videos of these launches can be found in the show notes on our website, spaceandthingspodcast.com, as well as links to articles about all the stories I'm about to discuss. I think the story that's most gripping this week is the fact that the Artemis 1 rocket is slowly getting ready to be rolled out of the Vehicle Assembly Building at Kennedy Space Center. In fact, the day this podcast goes live on the 17th of March, it should be rolling out. It's the first time that a rocket designed to carry humans to the moon has been rolled out of that building since the Apollo program, and in my opinion, it's a beautiful looking rocket. The rocket will launch the Orion spacecraft to the moon with no crew on board. It's a 26-day journey designed to ensure that Orion is capable of carrying humans to space and back. If all works out okay, then we should see Artemis 2 launch in 2024 with a crew on board, potentially becoming the first humans to visit the moon since 1972. But they won't be landing on it. The honour of landing on the moon goes to the Artemis 3 mission. But as we discussed last week, the date for that is slipping back even further, maybe 2025, 2026. Anyway, it would be great to see Artemis 1 get rolled out this week, and I'm looking forward to seeing the crawler back in action again. On Tuesday, 15th of March, there was a six and a half hour spacewalk to prepare the International Space Station for the rollout of the third new solar array panel. Uh, Kayla Barron and Raja Chari will be the ones in the spacesuits on this occasion, and it's Chari's first EVA. The pair are also due to perform a spacewalk together next week on the 23rd of March. And while we're on the ISS, uh, NASA astronaut Mark van der Hey has broken the record for the longest US space flight. At 12.24pm Eastern Daylight Time on March the 15th, he surpassed Scott Kelly's record, which he achieved in 2013, of 340 days, 8 hours and 42 minutes. He's due to come back to Earth on his 355th day in space, and it's been confirmed that despite all that's going on, he will be coming back on the Soyuz spacecraft. And a quick summary of other news. The Ingenuity helicopter has completed its 21st flight on Mars, travelling 370 metres at the speed of 3.85 metres per second. Or that's 
1,214 feet, travelling 8.61 miles per hour, depending on your measurement currency of choice. Fortunately, our time measurement is broadly agreed on, so I can say with confidence that the flight lasted 129.2 seconds. Uh, Elsewhere, SpaceX has turned 20 and they've released a 98-second celebration video, which will be in the show notes. Virgin Orbit has announced it will proceed with the first ever orbital launch from UK soil this summer, which is very exciting for us Brits, who have also just had a new £100 million space research hub opened by Tim Peake in Leicester. And finally, in now what seems like a tradition, Blue Origin have announced the celebrity that will fly on the next crewed suborbital flight due to launch on the 23rd of March. This time, it's actor Pete Davidson, who is, of course, dating Kim Kardashian. I'm sure that, just like me, you were both very aware of this and cared greatly about it. Hmm. Anyway, I imagine as a result, the flight will be getting a lot of publicity and hopefully that might inspire some youngsters to pay more attention to science and technology at school. And that's it for this week. Uh, hopefully, Dave did a good job on the news. I am sure he. Di- I am sure he did a fantastic job. And uh, thank you all for listening and for continuing to support our little podcast. It really does mean a lot. And don't forget to have a look on Facebook for us, as Dave mentioned earlier, and let us know if it's working. Yeah, please do. If it's not, then check again next week. I'm sure I'll remind you. Anyway, wherever you listen to us, don't forget that in space, no one can hear you stream. Space and Things has been brought to you by And Things Productions.